Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. My name is Jesse Day, and before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is the director of WMC and a technical advisor for the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, somebody I'm very excited to talk to about uranium. It's Per Jander. Welcome to the show. Hi, Jesse. Great to be on. Great to have you here. And as it is your first time, as is the custom with this show, the origin story is where we start. So how did you first discover uranium and how did that lead you to becoming a uranium trader and a technical advisor for the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good story. Uh, c- clearly not a short one. I don't think anyone is a little kid that runs around and wants to be a uranium trader. But uh, I would say uh, in college, I studied uh, artificial and artificial intelligence and financial markets. So maybe I thought I was going to build some smart uh, trading algorithms and then I can have a cushy job and make a bunch of money. Um, but uh, clearly I was ahead of my time because that's starting to happen now, but <laughs> it didn't back then. Uh, so I started in electricity trading straight out of uh, straight out of college. I was in on the North Pole market. I grew up in Sweden, so I, I moved to Oslo uh, and yeah, beautiful country, great hiking. And uh, yeah, I was on the, on the electricity exchange. Now that didn't uh, last. I was working with Enron. I went back up shortly after, but then I ended up with a, with a Swedish utility um, in a sort of a graduate management program where you'd rotate around the company. So I started in trading and then they said, all right, now you got to spend, spend three months somewhere else. And uh, I'd worked with hydropower before. I worked with uh, combined heat and power before, and they were pretty big in nuclear. So it's like, I don't even know what to think of nuclear. Do I like it? Do I not like it? It's kind of, it's kind of sounds cool, but it's also a little scary. Uh, so I just, okay, how about I just go and work at the nuclear power station? Uh, and uh, yeah, that's one of those moments that kind of changed your life, I guess, when you when I got there. And I was just absolutely fascinated, you know, these amazing machines built by humans and uh, just humming along, you're standing there looking at the, the, at the water pool, essentially, and just below that water, uh, about 10 meters down, was uh, 5% of Swedish electric- electricity production. It's... Uh, Kind of blew my mind. And I was also at this point, uh, early 2000s, um, also climate change was clearly becoming an issue. And I was quite concerned with it, am quite concerned with it. So that's uh, that's how I got into nuclear energy. And then I was definitely working there for a while, but wanted to get a little bit more international exposure. So I, uh, I ended up with the Trade Association, the World Nuclear Association, who uh, is based in London. It's sort of a, yeah, come. Uh, organizations, whether nuclear nuclear companies from all over the world, whether it's mining companies or nuclear operators or reactor vendors, they all come together and it's sort of have as a common voice. And I was working on towards the UN a lot there with climate change and sustainable development. So then I got that aspect covered a little bit and eventually ended up with Cameco. So Cameco asked me and like, hey, we need a uranium uh, sales guy for Europe. Uh, we think you could be good at it. And uh, that's how I got into uranium sales and obviously chemical. They buy quite a lot of uranium as well. So there was buying and selling uranium and I did that for about 10 years. And, and then we started our own company with, uh, with WMC where I am now. So not, not a straight road in any way, but, uh, but, but certainly it all made sense from the, from the trading aspect and electricity to the nuclear energy. It all came together. Yeah, absolutely. Great origin story. And I do want to talk about the buying and selling of uranium because For people who invest in the uranium space, it can be quite opaque and it can be quite difficult to understand all of the different elements of the transactions occurring with uranium, the nuclear fuel cycle, etc. So maybe you could start start by breaking down the market for us because we know there's trades that happen on the spot market. There's carry trades and carry traders, if you could explain what that is, and also long term contracting and any other ways that uranium is transacted? I know it's kind of a, a big question, but um, however you'd be able to, to give us an overview of how that all works. I uh, know I'm happy to take a crack at it. And, and also a quite slight disclaimer that it's opaque to people to do trade uranium as well. So it's, a, it, it's, a, it's an interesting community, but it's, a, it's definitely not a, a market where you sit and just click on a, on a screen and, and buy and sell that way. That way. It's very much, uh, very much a relationship-based industry. You only deal with people you know. 
you have established relationships with. And, uh, and I would say if you start with the spot market, it's, uh, it's grown a lot in the, in the last 15 years for sure, but it is still what most people would consider, uh, in its infancy or an archaic market. It's, uh, it's a lot of phone calls, emails, uh, messages on the phone even. Um, and, uh, and you have, uh, say a dozen, 15 very regular actors on that market. And then you have another 10, 15, maybe that are kind of on the periphery. And, uh, and yeah, you, uh, you talk to each other directly. There's a few broker services where if you want to be anonymous, you can go through them. Uh, but there's, uh, there's not necessarily a transaction every day. Most of the time there's a few, so you have a few price points, but it's clearly and it's uh, reporting is on a voluntary basis. So then you have a few price reporters who sort of objectively collect this information and then publish a price at the end of the day. Very hard to get an intraday price. Uh, they're starting to move in that direction. And so the market is maturing, but it's still, yeah, very, very much in its infancy, I would say. Um, so uh, so that's, that's the spot market itself. Um, and then when you look at utilities who are the main end buyers in this market, uh, they don't necessarily buy that much of their uranium they need on the spot market. They might do 10, 15, some even 20%, but it's not more than that. So they're active on what's called the term market. And that's where, uh, uh, yeah, it's even, it's even more opaque. So it's definitely hard to know what's going on there. And it's, it's, uh, it's bilateral agreements. So definitely when I was working with Cameco, then you talk to every utility under the sun, and then you do longer term agreements where you that could be a delivery from anywhere from two years out to 12, 15 years out. There might even be some that are even longer now. Um, and it's all a negotiation thing. And you start your delivery when you agree, those deliveries don't even start until a, a little bit further out in time. Uh, and then what happened, say, about 15 years or so ago, then you started having this carry trades that you can because we, we were in a very I guess then we'll have to go after the last peak uh, of uranium price in 2007. But uh, then after that, when uh, they went into a bit of a bear market, you had a very large oversupply in the spot market. So there was a lot of spot material. It was quite depressed. And prices were around $20, $25 a pound. And on top of that, there was a very low interest rates. So in that environment, it was quite easy to be with say do a carry trade so you buy material in the spot market you find a way to finance it either with your own money on your balance sheet or you find external financing entities and then you offer them at fixed prices out in time in the term market to uh, to utilities so uh, that's what wmc did to begin with uh the basic business model uh, were quite successful so we had a few uh, successful transactions um but then of course as uh, as the spot market gets tighter and tighter and interest rates go up, that sort of transaction becomes less attractive. So in today's market, when the spot market is very, very tight and, and the interest rates are quite high, it is not nearly as attractive. So it's uh, then it sort of shapes the contango in the market, but not entirely. It's a, those volumes are not nearly as big now as they were before. That's a great breakdown. Awesome. Now, that leads me to the next question, which is I'd love you to walk us through your day as a uranium trader, a day in the life, what you go through on any given day dealing with transactions, speaking with potential clients. Um, obviously, you have you have a lot of experience in the industry. If you want to kind of go back to your days at Cameco and, and how things work there as well and shed some light on that, that would be great as well. Uh, sure. Actually, it's it's fairly similar, uh, both now, a little bit more now, a little bit different because of the role I have with, with uh, Sprott as well. But uh, but in essence, because I've been North American based, uh, but working a lot towards European clients. Uh, so and now it might even start earlier because uh, the, the emergence of, I mean, China is a huge player in the market. Uh, Kazakhstan has obviously grown into become the largest source of uranium. So now it starts quite early, right? When you get up, you check in with your colleagues and friends over in that part of the world and, and see what's happening there. And then as you get into the office or as you get going, then you have a few hours when you overlap with the European market. So speak to some utilities over there, some trading entities, just to kind of get a feel for what's going on there. And mostly the spot market still follows North American market. So unfair to our friends in other parts of the world, but that's also why I choose to be located in North America, because even though I spend a fair bit of time on the road when you're over in Europe, 
it you still have you know from 3 p.m to 10 p.m you gotta be you gotta be checking your phone and see if something happens because it's not sort of a steady steady flow of transactions or things that come up it it definitely is sort of there's little spurts of energy and then it goes quiet and then something happens again and then obviously in the background of all this you also have this the utility activity that is something you're responsive to so the big tender comes out and then as you come up to the deadline of that one submit an offer and then it can be some negotiations back and forth but uh, but for me, I, I kind of like the mix. So you have uh, the longer term transactions, the really big ones with the utilities. That's the heart and soul of the of the nuclear fuel market. But still, you have the sort of the, the excitement of the spot market, the daily activities. You're going to be on top of things. What what happens there? So it's uh, it's a, it's a very good mix, I think. So let's now talk about the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, would you be able to walk us through the different stages of the nuclear fuel cycle? and how transaction occurs, how transactions occur at the different stages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, uh, it starts, uh, well, uranium is in the ground most of the time, uh, and could be in seawater, I guess, but we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, so you, you get it out of the ground, you mill it, uh, and then it, you, you make it into U308, which is the most basic form, natural uranium. Uh, it's, uh, it's a uranium oxide powder. And uh, that's the most commoditized of the forms. So it's sort of the first step in the fuel cycle. And that's where we have the most actors. Uh, there are basically three major Western hubs where you trade this, one in the US, one in Canada, one in France. And, uh, and it's sort of, a, that's where you have the most actors. You have to have an account at these places. So obviously you have all the large producers are there. The utilities have accounts there and, and then the trading entities as well. So that's where you have most of the activity. Um, and the reason why the uranium is shipped to these locations is that because that's where the conversion facilities are. So that's the next step of the fuel cycle. Uh, that's when you convert the uranium oxide into a gas, uh, hexafluoride, so UF6. And you need it to be a gas in order for it to go to the next step, and that's the enrichment, uh, enrichment stage. So when you have natural uranium, uh, it's a very small portion, about 0.7%. That is the U three two three five isotope. That's the fissile isotope. So that's the one that you that you use that can be split that creates most of the energy. Um, so what you need to do to have a sustained chain reaction in the Western designs that we use mostly in the Western world in a way is uh, the light water reactors. Uh, you need to enrich that from 0.7 to three to five percent, and that's the enrichment process. It's very, very brute, essentially, just like you have a 235, you have a 238. There's a slight weight difference between the two, about 1%, and you need to separate them. Uh, and you do that today by spinning them in a centrifuge. So that's spinning them very fast, heavy ones on the outside, lighter ones on the inside, and then you just repeat it about a million times. Uh, that's the, in, the, in a short sense, that's what you do anyway. Very exciting developments on using lasers and other, other ways to do it, but uh, from a commercial perspective, that's... The, the system we use today. Um, and from there, it goes into fuel fabrication. You need to put them into uh, fuel bundles that you then stick into the reactor and you replace them every 12, 18, 24 months, depending on the reactor. And I would say as you move down this chain, uh, the product becomes more and more specific for an individual reactor and less and less, uh, um, by, let's say like easy, to, you can't really trade it. The more specific it gets, the harder it is to trade. Um, some utilities, absolutely, you can bundle the first three stages. Uh, so you have the uranium, you have the conversion service, and you have the enrichment. You bundle that to one and you form EUP. It's called enriched uranium product. And that's what goes into the fuel bundles. Uh, so you can do like a tender for EUP. That happens now, especially for uh, reactor operators of the uh, Russian type reactors, the VVR reactors in Europe, uh, because they had all the supply from Russia now, because of the conflict with Ukraine, uh, the Euratom supply agency has tell, told them we can't be relying on Russia anymore, so you need to diversify. And they need basically all of it at once. Otherwise, it could be a three, four pro year process where you buy uranium, you buy a conversion, you buy enrichment. But if you don't have that much time, you need to buy everything at once. You send out the tender for EUP. And, uh, and that obviously creates a bit of pressure on the market because it's normally not done. Uh, so that's definitely contributed to some of the market movement we've seen over the last two years. Very interesting. I was going to ask about that, the effect of a squeeze on conver conversion and enrichment capabilities, as you were pointing out, um, utilities and countries as well are wanting to get away 
from Russian supply. And Russia doesn't supply a ton of the world's uranium, though not a small amount either, but they do supply the majority of the conversion and enrichment. So under these circumstances, maybe you could give us some more insight into how that could affect the price of uranium itself as a commodity. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very good point. And uh, so like you say, Russia is not big on uranium, but they are very big on conversion and enrichment. Uh, so what happens if you're going to move away from Russia, you need to replace the conversion and enrichment with capacity in the West. The capacity is there to a certain extent. You're definitely going to need more. So I'm quite certain more will be built, but it's going to take up until 27, 28 before that's online. Uh, but you can make up for it. You cannot make up for conversion, but I think there is enough capacity because uh, uh, Converdine, the large U.S. producer, is just restarting their facility after idling it for about five, six years because the market was so depressed post Fukushima. Now they're ramping back up. So that will create the conversion services we need. And the reason this is important is that because uh, when you have enrichment, an enrichment facility, you have some flexibility in how you produce there. Uh, and it's uh, and depending on how you choose to operate your plant, that in turn determines on how much uranium you need to put into it. So after Fukushima, markets were depressed, a lot of idled, idled uh, enrichment capacity. It could, you can basically run it as a uranium mine. So you just squeeze more uranium out of the feed that you put into it and you create the same amount of end product. You just use more work to get that uranium out of it or that enrichment out of it. And that leaves you with a lot of natural uranium that you then can sell into the market. Now we have the opposite happening because you don't have enough enrichment. So in order for you to free up some of that enrichment capacity, you need to put a lot more uranium into it. And that's called overfeeding. And this swing, um, it's about, it, it's gonna represent about a 30% increase in uranium demand in the West to make up for this. So that's the connection between the shortage of enrichment and the additional tightness in the uranium market. And uh, yeah, like because it's gonna take a while for a new Western enrichment capacity to come online, it's a very tight market for the next few years. I wanted to maybe have you shed some light on conversations you may be having with utilities, obviously as much as you're able. Um, are you seeing a sense, a, a heightened sense of urgency at this point in time? And are you seeing more and more favorable long-term contracting terms and prices for the sellers? I talked with uh, John Cash, the CEO of UR Energy recently. He was saying these days it really feels like it's becoming a seller's market for uranium. So I'm wondering if you agree with that and, and what you're seeing in your own conversations. Uh, yeah, it's 100% a seller's market. Uh, I know John quite well. It's a great guy. We went to, uh, to a training camp about 15 something years together. Now time flies. But, uh, but, you, but yo, you're absolutely right. It is completely a seller's market. They can more or less dictate the terms. Back in, back in the market was pretty depressed. Uh, utility could ask for a 20, even 30% volume flex, which is basically just free optionality that you can say that I, I choose to take this much more or this much less. Uh, and that obviously when things started to change with the war, there was not a mad rush to the bank for all this because they had so much flexibility baked into their already existing contracts. That's why the market didn't see that right away. Now the producers saw it. Some of them could ramp up their capacity in order to absorb that. Some of them had to go to the market and cover. So it's uh, so that was sort of the, the first thing that happened. And then uh, utilities, yeah, they, they, they rarely panic. They're, uh, I mean, one of the benefits, but first of all, they're very level-headed people. So if you've ever met the reactor operator, they will never get panicked by anything because that's what they're trained to do. Uh, but, but even fuel buyers have that sort of that sense of calm around them. And one other aspect that's pretty unique on uh, when it comes to a nuclear power station is that you only refuel it once every year or sometimes even every two years. So, and you have some spare fuel bundles on your site so it's very rare. I mean, if you have a gas power station and something happens to the pipeline, well, you're going to run out. You have a few hours and that's pretty much it. When you have a nuclear power station, you still have a year or two. But of course, this fuel chain, that takes a long time to do all this stuff. Um, so there has clearly been a sense of urgency from these operators of the Russian design reactors I just told you about, mostly in, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, but of course, they've also they were more or less mandated to you have to change your supplier. So the the uh, the industry has been quite supportive. So I think it, it's definitely 
seen a lot of success from a, sort of a Western group of companies led by Westinghouse because of the different fuel design. So it's all, they've all been made in Russia. It's a different shape. They're hexagonal and not the square ones used in the West. So first you need to obviously be able to make those fuel bundles. So the utilities needed to rush to Westinghouse and get all these contracts and they're quite technically complicated too. So this took some time. Uh, but the second they were done with those contracts, then, okay, immediately turn into the fuel market. And that's kind of what we saw starting last year. And it's carrying over to this year too. Uh, Finland was the first, uh, one of the first, one of the companies, they went, Finland was the first ones to get it done. And they've had press releases. I'm not saying anything that is not open. Uh, the, uh, the Czech Republic has followed. And now there's a few other Central European countries are getting there too. But it's... Uh, they're, they're clearly concern among uh, among fuel buyers, but it, there's no panic because uh, I mean I think there will be enough uranium too. It's just a matter of what price you pay, and and that's where it also comes in that a, a nuclear power station is not that price sensitive to the fuel cost because the fuel cost is only about 10, 15 percent of your operating cost. So if you do have an increase in fuel pr prices. It's not that bad, especially not lately since uh, since electricity prices have gone up quite a bit in, in a lot of jurisdictions. So they can absorb that. If you have a gas power station or, or a coal power station, you're much more sensitive to fluctuation in fuel, fuel prices. So for the time being, everything is fine. But but still, we are looking at a, at a fairly tight situation for the next couple of years. So and I think we're. We're already seeing some of that starting now over the last even couple of weeks that uh, that the uranium price is moving pretty fast. Uh, now, some of that might be hype as well. We'll see. But uh, but regardless, it's uh, it's uh, it's the highest prices since it's been in the last 12, 12 years. It was just an article in Financial Times this morning that, uh, that, yeah, we haven't seen this kind of price level since Fukushima. Wow. Yeah. The, the price has been moving. The equities have been moving as well. So people are getting pretty excited at, at the moment in the space. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the current spot price. Is it enough to incentivize production from a lot of these companies in development? Do you think it needs to go higher ultimately to bring enough projects online to supply the world's uranium needs? And if so, what, what would be your estimate for around where the price needs to be. Yeah, that that uh, that price is a moving target, I think. If you would have asked anyone about five, six years ago, they would have said, oh yeah, no, no, 55, 60 at the most, that's when you can have a lot of mines can come on. While you ask uh, those mines today, they will probably say something 75, 80, maybe even the 90s. So so that's moving. And of course there's been, and it's been COVID, so you had a lot of inflation, you have a lot of labor costs going up. Material costs go up, transportation costs go up, so it's all for good reasons. But uh, but I think uh, yeah, the times when uh, yeah, fifty dollars certainly forty fifty dollar uranium is probably behind us as well. Sixty, you should probably take it and run. And I think we're looking at, and, and it can certainly overshoot for a little bit too. I think it is going to be so tight in the next few years that we can certainly see higher prices, significantly higher prices, maybe even. But it probably feels that that eighty to hundred. A few years from now, that's uh, that seems reasonable. But again, I'm not uh, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not a forecaster in this, and and you know, the only thing you know about forecasts is that they're wrong. But uh, but that's that's the gut feel I think most people have. So, and I want to ask your opinion on what you think will be the next jurisdiction to become a big uranium producer. Obviously, right now we have Canada, Kazakhstan, Australia being some of the major ones. Um, who are you seeing next in terms of countries or jurisdictions that are currently in the development phase, or maybe they're producing a little and um, might eventually ramp up? The United States, obviously, an interesting story because the the government there did start a strategic uh, nuclear fuel reserve where they bought some pounds from domestic producers there. We have a few companies there producing in smaller quantities. Do you see that expanding and, and anywhere else you think that might be producing a lot of pounds in the future? Yeah, I think uh, Kazakhstan is going to be the undisputed largest producer for the time being. Canada is obviously ramping up very quickly because they were quite large, not the largest. Well, they were the largest before Kazakhstan got really big. But uh, but Cameco shut, obviously, to its largest mines, and they are just coming online. So I think next year you're going to see an undisputed number two. Uh, number three, I think, is actually Namibia. So Namibia is bigger than people think. Now a lot of that material is owned by China, so it just 
goes into the the big Chinese program. But uh, but there's some other uh, some other mines there too. So they are definitely a jurisdiction to keep an eye on. Um, and then Uzbekistan, uh, they uh, they are fairly large today, and they have plans to to double their production. And it's very similar uh, assets as uh, as to Kazakhstan. The so same mining methods, obviously. Same problem of getting the material that where the uranium is, is not where you need it. So it needs to get from Central Asia to mostly the West, but obviously a lot of it is going to China and even Russia for, for processing. So yeah, the geopolitics are changing very quickly. Of course, Niger is a fairly significant supplier too, and we have a lot of concerning developments there. So it's, uh, yeah, you, you definitely have to keep an eye on geopolitics in this industry, that's for sure. And I know a lot of viewers are already familiar with the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, but maybe um, as the technical director there, you could give us an overview from your perspective on the role of the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, exactly how it works. I've seen some misconceptions out there. People are saying, what if Sprott suddenly decides to sell everything, um, which I don't think is a possibility. So maybe you could um, uh, explain that to us and, and how Sprott functions. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm only in charge of the, of the, of the physical inventory and, and deal with all the physical transactions. So when it comes to the technicalities of the, of the trust, it's probably best to talk to Sprott about that. But, uh, but yeah, clearly we, we're, uh, we're, we like right now, we don't, we, we can't sell material other than to raise money to, to function, uh, to keep the trust running. But, uh, but there may be a redemption feature in the future, uh, whether that, where that's going, it's too early to speculate on. I'll, I'll leave that to, to Sprott to talk about, but, uh, but it's, yeah, it, it, it's a vehicle for people to invest and get physical exposure to uranium. And I think uh, today it's, it's clear the most successful considering the moving uranium price yesterday, it's uh, actually over $4 billion right now. So it's, uh, it's head and shoulders larger than anything else. And I, I think the success story of it is, is unparalleled. So it's, uh, it's been going really well. It certainly was gone, been a lot more work, but it's been also a very, very, a lot of fun, uh, more so than, uh, more work than anyone for sale, I think, but it's, uh, yeah, very successful so far, but it's also a very interesting investment community. And I think investors that really got their eyes up on, on nuclear energy and, and uranium in specific, they, they called it right. It really is. And it, it's, it's still early innings. It's a long way to go. Uh, the sentiment around nuclear energy is only getting better for every day. So it's, and it's by no means done. It's, uh, if we're serious about decarbonization and electrification, the role of nuclear is it's going to grow and it's going to grow massively even. So it's, uh, it's, it's only early stages so far. And it's a very exciting time to be in the industry for sure. Definitely agree with you there. Yeah. Um, I'd like to end by asking for those who are watching, and there's probably only a few of them, but you never know, who might be thinking, this sounds really cool. I'm a, I, I love uranium. I'd like to become a uranium trader someday. Obviously, it's not a, a common career path, but for those who might be thinking that, um, what's the best way to get started and to set yourself on a path to be in, in your position? Wow, that's a good one. I never got that question before. <laughs> <laughs> is when you say you're a uranium trader. I mean, I don't say very often, but when I do, for, for example, when you go to immigration, when I came back, uh, came back yesterday and the immigration, you can't tell, like, he looks like he wants to handcuff you and he wants to buy you beer at the same time and he can't decide which one. But uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, how to get into it. Uh, out of my colleagues, a few commodity traders from other commodities, because uh, it is a commodity. It's a very basic commodity, like, like anything else. I think an understanding for, for nuclear energy definitely helps, especially if you're going to interact with, uh, with end buyers, the utilities, to understand their situation and their needs. Um, that certainly helps too. And, and most people in an industry are, are very passionate about it too. So, and I also would say it because it, it, you don't sit in front of a screen, uh, so you do interact with a lot of people. So if you're not a people person, it's probably not for you either, but it's, uh, it's a very tight knit community and it's a very good community. It's a lot of people come into it. They tend not to leave. It's a, it's just a, it feels like it's been, it's been attacked from so many different directions for so long that once you're in there, there is a sense of community, even between competitors. Uh, we all know that we all need each other. There's enough room for everybody and the future is looking very good. So it's uh whether you get into it via utility or via a trader or a mining company, 
it doesn't really matter. You just you'll find your way in there eventually, and uh, and it's uh, it's a great place to be. So I would highly encourage anyone who thinks it sounds fun just to have a look at it for sure. So. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Pear. A ton of knowledge shared. Um, for those who want to hear more from you, where is the best place to go online? Uh, obviously, we have a fair bit of uh, the Sprott Radio sort of a podcast uh, that's on the on the Sprott website, and then there's uh, do a fair bit of interviews with uh, Blur Street Capital. So uh, that's uh, Jimmy Connor over there. And other than that, I think it's uh, because there's so much hype around uranium now, you can basically just Google, I think, my name even, and then a bunch of things will come on. So it's uh, that was clear to never where I saw things going. But but I am like, yeah, I, I, I think it's a fantastic field, and I'll be happy to uh, to talk about it as much as I can. And I, I love being being able to have opportunities such like this, too, to just kind of inform as much as I can about it, because it is a, it's a very interesting field. You have a very unique perspective on the uranium industry, and we love talking uranium on this show. So it's been a very fun and enlightening conversation. Thank you once again for joining us, Pear, and sharing your knowledge with our audience. Uh, thanks, Jesse. Anytime. I really enjoy it.